um, while we're doing an agile development here, really, really, really pleased to introduce a panel. We got a fantastic participation from Spain to the Netherlands, from the investor side all the way to uh, some fintechs. And I do want to quickly introduce my panel, which one or two are still getting uh, mic'd up at the moment. Uh, to start off with Simon, she is an MD and the head of fit business at Barclays, has a fantastic perspective on what's happening on the investor side, what's happening across the different asset classes at the moment, followed up by Rene from the uh, Netherlands and the head of listings at the Euronex. Then we have Sebastian, a partner at Red Alpine, an early stage VC investor. Max from Raisin, the CBO uh, and formerly a deposit solution and some stints prior to that also and on the investment side. And last but not least, Arturo, all the way from Spain, favorite country of Corinna, as we heard, um, who is a former entrepreneur, but also now the head of the Spanish FinTech Association. So what we really want to talk about right now is about a lot of sets, but first of all, I think we should give a quick applause to the panelists at this late stage of the day. maybe set the scene across everything. Uh, we started off the day with talking about fintech funding. We actually started off the day with someone who had a very interesting story to tell. And we see that fintech funding at the moment, we're running at around about 40 billion at the run rate at the moment. That is down 75% to compared to 2021, but it's about the same number which we have seen in 2018, 2019, and 2020. We're seeing the numbers of deals actually declining quite a bit, but there are still activity happening. And we are still seeing a lot of FinTech activity, a lot of hiring, and we're still seeing a lot of activity in terms of new product development happening here. So what we really want to explore for the next 40, 45 minutes is really what is the state of the union and how we're we starting with that. And Arturo, I'm going to start with you giving your new responsibility as the head of the association. Where do you see things going? What's happening out there? So, uh, unless you've been on holiday for a very long time, uh, you, you'd be aware that inflation is up, interest rates are up, uh, there's fear uh, of a recession, there's very little growth, and uh, uh, that has a, an impact in all uh, cyclic economic activities. And, and guess what? FinTech is no exception. So what, what we are seeing is a reduction in, in, in funding. Actually, the numbers are, uh, if, if you read them in isolation, are quite spectacular, like 58% uh, down from the previous year. But if we put that in context, uh, uh, 2022 is still the second best funding year in the FinTech history. Although, if you drill down a little bit, and if the year had started in the second half, we're probably b back four or five years. Then, in terms of, of, of transactions, uh, not much, but we've grown up, like 1%. Uh, uh, so, meaning there's been more transactions uh, in 2022 than in 2021. And, and then also in terms of M&As, uh, volume has gone significantly down. Like we, we've gone back four years to 2018 levels. Uh, so if you read all these data in combination, what, what, what this means is uh, that valuations have gone significantly down, that we've had less mega deals, and that we've had much more uh, investment in very early stages, seed and, 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 and early. Uh, and, and this makes sense because it's like uh, extending the exit horizons uh, for VCs. Uh, so, what's the impact of all this in, in, in the fintechs? Uh, it depends what stage you're at. So, if you are a very early stage, you have a sound uh, business proposition and business model, you'll probably be able to find fun funding at a lower valuation that you would have two years ago, but it still is possible. Uh, if you're a more mature fintech that, that has uh, uh, proven that it can grow, uh, what you would probably want to do is uh, either shorten your path to profitability or, 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 or uh, reduce your, your capital needs for growth so that you can uh, postpone your funding or minimize it uh, because valuations are not going to be nice. And if you're caught in the middle, then you're in a tough spot. So if you haven't proved uh, that you can generate revenue or you're generating very little revenue, then you're, you're in, a, in a tough spot. 
So, so thank you for that. It's a very interesting, and in your an early stage VC investor. Does it mean your books are full and lots of opportunities? How is it feeling from your perspective? We are right in the middle of uh, what's happening right now and I can totally second uh, what Arturo said in the beginning. Um, it's very quiet. So actually um, I talked with a lot of funds um, because early stage funds talk a lot with each other uh, in order to, to, to see what's going on and um, uh, through the bank almost no deal activity right now. And the earlier you go, um, I think the more psychology is important. And uh, my, one of my explanations is uh, first that uh, the startups were told it will gonna be tough. Everyone is going out uh, beginning of uh, 2023. So probably work on your business, build great unit economics and then go out later in the year. Um, and what we now see is Nobody's going out. Pretty tough. And uh, what I uh, would uh, definitely recommend is uh, for, for startups to use the time before all the others are coming um, to raise funds now. And now I come to the second point, is, uh, which is the other uh, psychological factor, uh, which is um, <laughs> that people need to overcome the ego that uh, the valuations of the last two years are not true anymore. And I talked with the founders and I said like, yeah, I hope the market gets better and I don't take the valuation cut, but at one point you need to go. So and if you go out later this year with all the others, um, um, I don't think that investors are able to um, process all the deals that are then available. They need to prioritize to the most important ones, the, most, uh, the best ones, so capital might concentrate about, around the best and the rest uh, has a big problem. I mean, allow me, it's a very interesting perspective. I actually want to ask the founder, so to speak, in the group, the, the, the fintech. Some people may say Raisin is not a fintech anymore, it's a unicorn and even much, much bigger than that one. But how does it feel for your perspective? Can you maybe talk a little bit about the, the journey and maybe as much as you can share the internal thinking? Does it impact you at the moment? What would you recommend? Sure. Um, so maybe let me start with kind of how I generally view uh, the environment and then give a little bit of the raisin perspective. I mean, I think it's totally clear that the funding environment is much tougher now. And I think it's also relatively clear that 2021, 20, uh, uh, we did see some exuberance and there were deals being done that probably shouldn't have been done at valuations that uh, didn't make sense. And I've, I'm old enough to see a number of cycles uh, uh, quite a bit driven also by FOMO uh, of investors who uh, you know, didn't want to miss out. And I think now we've, uh, we've left space, we're back in the atmosphere, uh, some <laughs> general principles of gravity uh, apply again. And uh, so there's a lot more focus now, I think, on business models, on unit economics, on cash flow, what's the path to exit. And I personally think that's probably healthy um, that there's more focus on quality uh, versus quantity. At, at the same time, I feel like great businesses with great unit economics always got funded and, and will get funded. And just to t take a step back, so uh, when we started, I, I looked at some numbers, when we started uh, almost 10 years ago, um, I think the decade average of new unicorns created uh, per year, not just fintech, but generally in tech, was four per year. In uh, 2021, I think it was 534 in, in one year, and that's clearly not sustainable, and a lot of them probably will not be unicorns anymore. But on the other side, it will still be a lot more than when, when we started. And so, to come to the Raisin perspective, so generally I think we're in the comfortable position that we're a well-funded company. We raised around 300 million uh, since we started. We've um, probably been relatively measured, I would say even say b boring. Um, we generally try to do a funding round when we had an investment case that we can kind of sensibly deploy that capital, not just because we could raise. Um, and we've been trying to focus on quality investors and a mix of diversified investors that can support us through the cycle. So we have some 
uh, I think, great VCs with uh, Index, Ribbit, Headline, Thrive. We have some private equity or growth equity investors like uh, Greycroft um, and uh, Vitruvian. And we have some listed uh, company investors like Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, or PayPal, or Shinovik. Um, we've actually done our last funding round in 2019. Um, so we actually have not raised for, for a while. And what we decided at the point in time is that rather than raise at the peak of the market, um, we saw a huge opportunity to combine the two largest platforms in Europe with Deposit Solutions and Raisin to try to really uh, combine the strength of these two companies and create a European champion and a category leader. And I think that, in a way, forced us to do a lot of things that are required of companies today. So, I mean, we did look at things like market consolidation as a result of that. We did look at cost, and from our perspective, we feel that's, that's paid off. So, just to, uh, our kind of core business is doing very, very well. We, I think, made public that last year we broke through uh, 30 billion in AUM. Um, we actually just last month grew by 2 billion AUM in one month um, and, we, um, and we're profitable. So I would say we're you know, generally in a position where we don't have to raise, but obviously if there's a great business case that comes along, we could. And I think it's important to come back you know, that fundraising is not in, in a means in itself. Uh, I think for a while it was like everyone was, you know, look how amazing round I raised. I mean, the entire purpose of raising funds is to build a great business. So, Thank you so much for that. Rene, I just wanted to also uh, bring you into the conversation. I mean, if you're listening to this, everything, and obviously as a stock market, you have a slightly different view. On, is this a rosy picture? Or would you see that also echoes all the conversations of people potentially listing at your place? I think the situation in the public markets have uh, been very much the same as in the private market. I think a few years ago there was uh, a perception in the market that there was a huge difference between financing your company in a private capital market compared to public, where investors in the public capital market are typically a bit more risk averse. Right, so they need to have a certain track record. Uh, they need to have a visibility. Um, they're not just buying a company because of the optionality. Uh, they need to make sure that that option actually uh, is, is worth something. Uh, so public investors have always been a bit more defensive uh, and, and really looking, uh, let's say, at the track record of the company, where in the private capital market, and we've also seen that uh, with the new enormous amount of specs that actually came to the market in 2020 and 2021, a lot of private equity investors uh, that formed themselves into sponsor groups and actually tapped the market eh, because there was so much capital actually just waiting to be invested somewhere, uh, somehow, uh, that a lot of specs actually in the US arrived, also in, uh, in Europe, and that was actually a signal. Uh, and we have seen that also in the past, eh, in the period 2006 and 2007, eh, because SPACs is not, not something new. Eh? It, it, is, it has been there for, for many years. And actually also in 2007 and 2008, eh, in that period, you saw also a lot of private capital flowing into SPACs just to find a, a different opportunity eh, to create some alpha. Uh, and that is actually what also happened in 2020, 2021. Eh? So uh, also as Euronext uh, and Euronext Amsterdam specifically, eh, we added uh, a number of SPACs uh, and some of those specs will actually not be successful. Uh, but why have they been so successful uh, in 2021? Because there was so much capital just looking for uh, investments, uh, for the opportunity, um, and, and not really having a very clear investment story behind that. And I think that private and public markets have more uh, 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 come together in a certain way. There's not so much difference anymore. Uh, which is good, um, because that also makes a, a listing, uh, in, in a, a, let's say, uh, accessing capital uh, by, by doing a public listing, makes it more attractive uh, and also a more decent alternative uh, for uh, investing your company in the private capital market. So clearly, I think there's actually not that much difference uh, between private and public anymore. The question is, of course, okay, will that, uh, will that maintain uh, that, uh, uh, that, that equal uh, level playing field? or when markets recover, uh, because somewhere in time they will clearly recover, uh, when will that then 
create a kind of a gap uh, again eh, between how investors behave in the private and capital market. I, I do not think so, eh, because I think that, that all investors have uh, eh, come into a new normal. Uh, but, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Sebastian, you? Yeah, um, to directly uh, jump on that, so definitely there's a development that private market valuations have drastically um, uh, changed. However, um, the time until it trickles down is very different. Mm -hmm. um, so the growth funds, the Vitruvians of this world, um, um, they are quite close to the public markets. They need to value their assets uh, pretty, pretty close <coughs> what's happening. Huh? Uh, if you go um, um, earlier in the value chain, um, it gets a little bit distro uh, distorted, the reality, by, by vision. And crazy, what, what, I'm, what I'm seeing at the moment is uh, that There are currently a lot of angel rounds uh, closing <laughs> with still valuations of, uh, of the last two years. And why is that? Easy explanation, um, because uh, an angel investor doesn't really care about this kind of valuation. They knew, oh yeah, it was kind of normal, I just want to be in the business, I want to support, and if this is going to be big, I make a good uh, amount of money, it doesn't matter if this is now a 5 million cap or 10 million cap. Um, uh, even having a cap is something quite new in Europe, I would say, to, to raise convertible loans uh, instead of uh, doing price rounds. This is something that uh, came up in the, in the last years. So that's on that side. And I just wanted to, to add something positive on uh, what was coming out of the last two years. And this is that um, the European <coughs> startup ecosystem came into the spotlight, uh, into the global spotlight. There's no, almost no top-tier U.S. fund that didn't open an office uh, in Europe in the last two years. And this is really, really great for the ecosystem, right? And I talked uh, two years ago uh, with a, with a top-tier U.S. firm and asked, why are you coming to Europe? And they said, because it's cheap. Um, and that's actually the explanation. It's uh, they're searching for alpha. Um, however, it would be great if we have our own growth equity firms uh, um, in Europe, that the proceeds of our uh, successful startups are not uh, going to the US pensions and insurances, but to European pensions and insurances. And that's what I'm, what I'm hoping for to, uh, for the future. You know, I, I would totally, uh, as a passionate European, concur with that when I was at the World Economic Forum post-2008. We looked at this because one of the issues was that at the time, basically, the, when the debt balloon got passed on from U.S. homeowners to financial institutions and then basically in a way to government balance sheet, the regulation in Europe, if it's on the insurance side, Solvency 2 or some of the pension regulation, basically made it very, very difficult for European institutional investors to invest in risk assets because they needed to hold Uh, a lot of capital against it. And I think that's something that we really need. Uh, we need to allow European institutional investors to invest in European VC and PE because, I mean, if we see it, if you look early stage, you see a lot of uh, European funds today. But if you look late stage, um, you know, we would be talking to uh, US investors, Asian investors, or Middle East investors, very few on the European side. So I think it's an interesting question. Um, we, as McKinsey, did an analysis a year and a half ago where we compared the whole funnel. And it was actually interesting. just want to throw that as a question towards you. When we looked at the amount of base innovation, Europe and the US were very similar. Even when we looked at the amount of VC funding, it was relatively similar. The moment we got into the late stage VC and then further on, we saw an increasing gap factor one, four, four up to the factor of eight. So I'm wondering when I'm putting this together, I'm hearing a new ecosystem evolving, I'm hearing spec. Also a little bit towards the investor side, you two over here, do we see new standards evolving? Uh, is the early stage we see Angel going to stay as it is, but the rest is finally aligning with the US or are we finding something new? Well, I, I must say I'm, I'm not a, a, a professional investor, so, so what, I'm, what I'm going to say, you have to take it uh, with, with a grain of salt, but I think that the, the, one of the main differences between the US and Europe is that in, 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 in the US you have like a 300 million people market, whereas in Europe you have the addition of 27 markets that striving to be a single market. So uh, solutions don't scale in Europe the same as they do in the US by a, a, a long margin. 
So I think that that relates. So I, I think Europe has, uh, uh, as you well said, has a lot of talent, uh, a lot of development capability. But then when it comes to 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 growing, either you jump elsewhere or you're limited in in your growth. To underline what we see as Euronext is indeed there are a lot of positive incentives huh, being uh, created in Europe huh, to make it, let's say, first of all, huh, to connect the different phases of the financing cycle of a company much better, right? So from angel to VC to private equity to IPO. Uh, and then, let's say, the company is mature enough really to decide themselves eh, what, what, what they want to do. Um, and so the connectivity actually within the financing cycle, eh, that is something which actually attracts a lot of attention. Uh, let's say not only by investors and parties in the ecosystem, eh, but also on, on national uh, level and even on European level. And what we see as Euronext also is that uh, there are a lot of positive incentives uh, being drawn by the European Commission uh, to stimulate a public capital market uh, for ambitious companies uh, to keep them in Europe. Uh, because that is actually the common uh, ambition that we, I think, all have, is to make sure that the unicorns and the potential unicorns do have access to the European capital market and not force them outside Europe uh, to keep them in Europe and uh, to make optimal profit uh, of their success. Uh, but there is a lot of things that need to be done. Uh, but fortunately, there are, first of all, there is a common uh, awareness uh, that this is extremely important uh, for the agenda in Europe. Um, uh, you talked about the formation of the European capital market. That will also be one of the elements uh, which definitely need to develop, uh, meaning that a French investor will have easy access, let's say, to a growth company in the Netherlands, and a Dutch investor can also access quite easily uh, a Spanish company who uh, would also give a nice uh, uh, pro uh, an opportunity. Uh, so there are clearly some things that need to develop, uh, but I think also uh, to, to add to that, there is positive momentum. And I think uh, uh, despite the short-term effect that we all have to uh, cope with, let's say for the longer term, there is clearly some positiv positivism uh, there. Sebastian. Yeah, so um, to, to build on what you said, Arturo, I, I totally agree. <clears throat> so the, the biggest different, difference is that you have like 360 million people, one language, and in Europe you have so many different countries, languages, regulations, etc. Super hard to uh, expand. Um, that's why if you, do, if you make something big in the US, it can grow super, super fast. So that's the one big thing. And the other big thing is that uh, what I touched in the beginning on, um, that in the US you have massively um, university endowments investing in venture capital, pension funds. Like if you look at the Yale endowment fund, more than 20% they um, allocate in private equity equity, uh, while in the average European pension funds, it's only three point something percent, right? That's the, that's the difference, and that's one of the best performing uh, um, um, endowments in the world. Um, so if we solve this problem to bring more cash, would be great, and what definitely what we have as an asset is uh, we have great talent, we have great universities, uh, we have great technical talent, but we, do, but we don't have the money um, um, to make them really big. And now we have momentum, we have positive success stories, we have people looking at Europe, and uh, so I'm looking for, for a good future. Max, how does it, just listening to everything here for the last five minutes, how does it feel from a user perspective, so to speak? Um, yeah, I want to just slightly disagree, and I'm a little bit more positive, but probably as an entrepreneur, you, you have to be. Um, so I don't see it quite as black and white in terms of in, it, it's, you can't really scale in Europe, and in the US, it's super easy. I mean, in the fintech space, um, I mean, in the US, for example, you need different licenses for all of the different states. They're easier to obtain, but it's also not quite as black and white that it's one homogeneous market. And at the same time, I mean, one of the reasons why we can and do operate uh, all across Europe is that you have European directives that allow, let's say, a bank to passport its banking license into uh, every single market. I mean, there's still, um, obviously, every country slightly interpreted in different way, and there's some headaches around it, but I think... Um, we do actually have a lot of foundations that allow companies to scale. And I also think for a long time we always said, um, I mean, I, I, I'm a passionate European who worked in New York for seven years and had to often listen to American colleagues uh, tell me that basically all innovation comes out of Silicon Valley and we're all lazy socialists in Europe. And um, I... 
I, um, I, I basically um, think that if you look at it, uh, to Sebastian's point, the, at the moment there's great stuff coming out of Stockholm, there's great stuff coming out of Berlin, there's great stuff coming out of Paris. I think the decentralized hubs that we have in Europe could become a strength if we're able to connect these hubs in a better way than we do today. But um, yeah, just I, I don't see it quite as black and white. No, thank you so much for the perspective. Just, I, just a, a, a quick point, because I, 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 I didn't try to portray it as black and white. I, I think we're moving in the right direction. We're still not there. So okay. it's, it's, it's significantly easier to scale in the US and in Europe, but I think we're moving in the right direction. I want to use the combined brain power the, of the group also to, to a slightly different question. We're talking about the future of funding of fintechs, but what fintechs are we talking about? So we've seen a lot of sub-segments over the last three years being very successful. I mean, let me ask the head of a fintech association. Where do you see the most traction and where is this going? Yeah, so we, we've been quite generic uh, uh, until now. And, 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 and uh, if you drill down, results are significantly different depending on, on a number of factors. First. It's not the same if you're a B2B fintech versus you, uh, being a B2C. So it's much tougher being a B2C in the current environment because uh, B2B, uh, it, uh, if you're a B2B, your customers will want to reduce costs and increase innovation. So there's still a market for that. Of course, you, have a, a, you still have an impact because uh, your customer has customers and that business is not going as well as, as, as it was two years ago. Then uh, it also varies a lot by stage, but we've, we've gone through that. So the worst place to be is in the middle uh, currently, uh, at least that's my view. And then it's also significant different uh, depending on the verticals. So uh, probably the ones that are being hit most are uh, first BNPL, uh, secondly, uh, perhaps wealth tech, although you might uh, disagree, and, and third, obviously crypto. Uh, but but all of them are being are being impacted in, in, in some way or, or another. And then, if I may uh, uh, make an additional comment that I left before. So I think many of the deals we've seen in the last few years were, uh, the, particularly the larger ones, were uh, related to companies that never had uh, a, a clear path to profitability. So the, the purpose of the company was inflating the balloon to sell it at the highest possible price, and that is, is going to change uh, significantly in the coming years, which I think is good. So uh, when you get too fat, you need to go on diet. So the fintech industry is now going on diet, and I, I think that will favor uh, IPOs in the future. Because Absolutely. I think when we talk about public markets, eh, so what, what are the, the fintech subsectors eh, that will attract most attention, let's say, from the wider eh, uh, com uh, investors eh, that are active in the public markets? Eh, the more mainstream, or let's say the more generic it is, eh, the better, right? So it, eh, we've seen a company like Artyen, for example. Everybody knows uh, Artyen at this point of time. Before the IPO, actually, nobody knew Artyen eh, because nobody was actually looking on their payment uh, uh, statements and eh, what Artyen actually did. And so the IPO, uh, eh, besides the financial success, brought a lot of uh, marketing value, actually. Uh, but that has been a true example and a true inspiration also for investors in the public domain uh, to really look at that part of the fintech industry because that has a wide audience. It is very consumer related. It is understandable. Uh, you can easily um, uh, see the opportunity, the financial opportunity. Um, and so the more specific it is, uh, the more limited your distribution power, of course, will be. Right? So, for example, with medtech, biotech, it's a very strong, dedicated group of investors, uh, but the pool of investors is actually relatively limited. Uh, so the wider the audience uh, is, uh, the more possibility it is to, uh, that the IPO will actually be successful. Max, I'm sorry, but this is too easy to pass up. Do you agree and disagree? And will we see raisin on the stock market very soon? Will we see raisin on the stock market very soon after what we just heard? Um, v very soon, probably not. I, I personally think um, that the IPO environment in general, I think in 23, is going to be pretty difficult still. I think um, generally, you, I believe you'll see more listings uh, in 24, 25 would be kind of my view. Uh, maybe just a comment on, on the environment. I think one of the important questions is also 
what does the current interest rate environment do to your business model? And so, I mean, if, if I look at our business model, uh, we're in the savings space. Um, we've basically been waiting for seven years that uh, we, we go back to positive rates and we go from uh, quantitative uh, easing to quantitative tightening. And we're, we're obviously for savers, it's a lot more interesting if you can get uh, 3% or than 30 basis points. And we see that uh, Google search, for example, for deposits is up more than 3x since last time. And um, for bank, banks on the funding side, um, there's about, I think, 3 trillion in TLTRO that need to be repaid by uh, European banks in the next uh, two to three years. And they need to be refunded in either capital markets or through deposits. So I think from our perspective, we feel that the, uh, for, for, for the core business, it's a fantastic environment. So we have heard a lot in the last uh, 35 minutes, uh, actually quite a lot of optimism about the process being healthy in many respects and um, leveraging the playing field between the US and, and Europe. We heard cautious degree of optimism that 2022 and 2023 are going to see lower but still sustainable levels of funding, but also some interesting things about, for instance, B2B business model, interest rate models, and the return of the IPO, if I may say so. But I'm just wondering if we want to do a quick round, Robin, at the end, if you were to say what's the outlook for the next 12 to 18 months and if there's any specific advice to give to the fintechs, but also the investors we have the room. I mean, Sebastian, maybe you want to start? Sure. Um, so I think that... We, uh, we might see, uh, um, to start with <laughs> negative one, uh, more insolvencies uh, um, um, coming, coming up. Um, but we will definitely see more uh, investor activity um, um, H2 um, beginning uh, 2024 because of the reasons I just mentioned. We will have less lifestyle founders that just uh, raise money because um, they want to do something different than uh, working in a consultancy. Um, uh, and we have more, <laughs> and we have more, uh, more businesses um, and that are working on sustainable unit economics and capital might concentrate around these companies. And that's what, what makes me happy and that uh, will deliver good quality to the uh, European ecosystem. Um, so I think the, that the basic fintech trends are, um, are continuing. I think digital is growing. Uh, consumers are increasingly moving to digital. And I also think it's not, it's not 2000. Yeah? We're not seeing kind of pets.com. There's, there, there, there's a lot of great business that have been built and, and, and will be built. Uh, I think we will see, uh, and I think for the, quality, uh, for the quality companies, it's a huge opportunity because I think we're going to see a lot more consolidation in the next uh, one or two years. So you will see a lot more fintech to fintech deals. I think you will see uh, bank to fintech uh, deals and a lot more kind of M&A activity. Uh, I think 2023 from a funding perspective is still going to be tough. It's going to be easier for early stage because for an early stage investor, if you're looking at an exit in seven years, um, the current environment is not so prevalent. Then if you're a late stage investor, then public equity markets and multiples um, matter. And uh, I personally think until 24, 25, uh, the environment will normalize both on the capital market side, and I think there's obviously a lot of dry powder in funds that at some point will need to be deployed. Thank you. Rene? Yeah, I fully align. So 2023 will be a very challenging year. Um, we see a lot of activity companies preparing uh, to access the market at the time that the markets are recovering. Uh, but typically, preparing an IPO takes a company 8 to 12 months, right? So talking about... At the, the short-term future, yes, I, I fully align that 2024 will be clearly better depending on the underlying market circumstance eh, because we actually do not know uh, what is going to happen, let's say, in the geopolitical situation and with interest rates and energy prices and whatever. So there's a lot of uncertainty and actually that uncertainty keeps away a lot of investors to actively participate uh, in new opportunities. Uh, 2024 clearly will be better than 2023. Uh, the long-term future, I think, for public markets is quite optimistic. Uh, I think, like I just said, uh, uh, the European Commission, uh, the ecosystem is doing a lot uh, to, to make public markets more attractive. Uh, but as you're next, we always say an IPO is not a goal. Uh, it's an instrument to finance your growth. Uh, so any company that even would consider uh, to, to do an IPO or to do a listing, 
should think very carefully, is a listing for me the best place? Eh? Is that really the way to, for me to finance my growth ambitions? Or should I remain private? Eh? That's for each company really to decide. And fortunately, we are in a situation that companies do have the time now to consider eh, what is the best route to the market and how should I prepare myself? Eh? But I think that the long-term future is quite bright, eh, but we need to have a bit of patience uh, in the short term. Well, first I will start with the bad news. So, uh, I think uh, for a company to succeed, you need three elements. One is talent, uh, the second one would be sweat, and the third would be luck. And one of the planets you need to align is being at the right point in the economic cycle. So, uh, companies with talent and with sweat will, will, will die uh, this year, so uh, a lot of value will probably be destroyed. But the good news, I think, is FinTech is here to say. Uh, that, that's, that, that, that's clear. Uh, we've seen a correction in the market triggered by the economic cycle, and uh, at some point, probably in 24, we'll see an inflection point, which will not mean that we'll go back to 22, sorry, uh, to 21 evaluations, but we'll start going up uh, again. Thank you so much. So we learned a lot. Most importantly, I will not become a lifestyle founder, um, but uh, lots of stuff to think about. Um, <laughs> Quite an interesting, probably not the easiest year ahead of us, but um, lots of stuff to think and also a future to look forward to. So I would ask everyone to just a final thank you for this fantastic panel. Sure. <laughs>